This evening, I want to begin what might become a short series reflecting on the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. Tonight, we will look together at just two of these verses from this well-known passage, often identified as the words of institution of the Lord's Supper. In verses 23 and 24, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. First, we will remind ourselves of the context in which this passage was written, both the history of the founding of the church in Corinth and the issues which prompted Paul to write. Then we will remind ourselves of the historical context for the actions and words of which Paul would remind his readers. This will set the scene for us to examine the words and actions in detail. We will look at what it might have meant to the disciples sharing the Passover meal. And we will look at what remembering those words and actions can mean for us. Back in Acts chapter 18, Luke records for us the beginnings of the church in Corinth. Initially, at least, Paul was supported there by Timothy and Silas. And we are told that Paul spent 18 months teaching the believers in Corinth the word of God. Another believer, Apollos, was also there spending time with the church teaching them. And from all of this, it would appear that the gathering of Jewish and Gentile believers had a good grounding in their new faith. But in this passage, we read, Paul is addressing a problem in the way the church did communion. Instead of being united in sharing together in the Lord's Supper, there were divisions, and a dignified and ordered celebration was replaced by a free-for-all. Now he has to remind them of what he had already taught them about the Lord's Supper. Paul cannot excuse their behaviour, and he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Not only did he teach them how to do communion, but his authority for what he taught was the Lord himself. This was not something Paul had made up. As we read in Galatians, it was something he received from the Lord and confirmed with Peter and James. It was therefore important for the Corinthian church and for us to take notice. And as I mentioned, it's this passage that has come down to us as the words of institution of the Lord's Supper rather than the words recorded for us in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. Um, and I need to remember that I'm supposed to be clicking doing the thing to keep up with this. So the instructions Paul reminds the Corinthians church about are focused on the Lord Jesus himself. He writes, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed. That's verse 23. And this little phrase roots the events Paul will describe to a person and a time and place in history. We should always remember this. Our God, the I Am, has not revealed himself in fairy stories, but through the lives of ordinary men and women at specific times and specific places. And the more archaeologists uncover, the more the evidence supports what is written in the Bible. And that, this is a distinguishing mark of the Jewish and Christian religions. As Christians, we have a confidence 
that putting our source text under honest scrutiny can only be good. Here, Paul identifies the events as taking place on the night Jesus was betrayed. There was a specific night and a specific place. Paul chooses a phrase that is in none of the parallel passages in the Gospels. Perhaps in his thinking, this was the counterpoint to the attitude of the believers in Corinth. It was on that night that Jesus freely gave himself over to be tried at the hands of sinful humanity. And this stands in stark contrast to the selfish, selfish attitudes demonstrated by the Corinthian believers. Would they and do we hear the reprimand? Paul does not record here any more detail, but the writers of the Synoptic Gospels give us a little more to help us. For example, Matthew records for us, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. According to Matthew as well, there was a certain house where the disciples pray, prepared the Passover. And that evening, in that house, Jesus could be found reclining at the table with his twelve close followers. The events took place at a specific time in a specific place. As we have just read, Jesus was reclining at a table with the disciples. Both Mark and Matthew record they were eating. And from the context, we already have, they were celebrating the Passover. In the next phrase, Paul tells us that Jesus took bread. Were Jesus' actions here an expected part of that ritual? It's difficult to be sure. But what he was just about to do and to say would change that ritual forever for the disciples and for us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Paul is aligned completely with the writers of the Synoptic Gospels on these three actions. Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And the order is consistent in all four accounts. How long did this take? Did he take a break a piece for each of the, the apostles? Was there something about the way Jesus performed this simple domestic activity that stuck in their minds? something that the two in Emmaus recognised as distinctive a few days later. Well, we don't need to know the answer to these questions, but perhaps in the asking, it helps us to slow down our minds so that we connect more closely to what those men experienced. Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it. What happened at that moment so that these three simple everyday actions became etched on the minds of the disciples? And they haven't recorded Jesus' prayer of thanks. Perhaps it was something like the traditional Kiddush. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. But perhaps it was a more intimate thanksgiving to his father, at that poignant moment. It is not recorded, so we don't need to know. But what has come down to us are the words Jesus spoke following that prayer of thanks. It seems to me that as Jesus was breaking the bread, 
he spoke the words we will now focus on. As Paul records it for us here in verse 24, Jesus said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we know, these words have caused much controversy, but seem to have been the reason, perhaps, for those three actions to have not been forgotten and ever tied to Jesus' words. Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So let's focus on each of these three phrases. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I was in conversation with a Roman Catholic priest a couple of years ago in an academic setting, and he confidently supported the idea that the bread Jesus held became his body. He just quoted these words back to me. This is my body. The words without context were enough for him and many others to be comfortable with their understanding. Similarly, a good Lutheran pastor is comfortable with the idea that somehow, although the bread remains bread, at some point the consecrated bread becomes also the body of Christ. And therefore, for the unbeliever to eat it is literally to eat judgment upon themselves. It's a reminder for us that context is everything, not only in the Bible, but in most things we read and in the words we speak and hear in everyday settings. Um, if, you have, if you're married, you definitely know that. For example, where are you going with that? Well, it could mean someone is carrying something and you want to know where they're taking it to. But it could also mean you're listening to someone recounting a story and you want to know what, it, what is the point they're trying to make. So a good question to ask when looking at the Bible is, how would the people present have understood this? Or even what might have meant it was difficult for them to understand at the time? It is also important to compare one scripture with another on the same theme for us, uh, on the same theme for us to get a more complete picture. Hence, tonight, although our text is just two verses in Corinthians, I'll also make, I've also made reference to all four Gospels. Uh, yes. So here, Jesus is gathered with his disciples, celebrating the Passover with real bread that has been provided for them. He takes a piece and says, this is my body. It's unlikely that this group of men, either then or subsequently, understood that the, bre the bread Jesus held and gave to his disciples to eat had somehow become his actual flesh. And therefore, in the very eating of it, some spiritual grace was received. After all, he remained standing there intact and unharmed. But if that is not the understanding, what is Jesus alluding to by using bread as a symbol to represent his body? And in that moment, how did the disciples understand the broken bread to be Jesus' body? We'll come back to this in a moment. Let's have a look at the next phrase to see if there are further clues to help us. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Both Matthew and Mark include in this phrase of Jesus the instruction to his disciples to take and eat, the latter being implied by Mark. It is only Luke who has the similar phrase given for you. This is an important piece of the jigsaw. This is my body given for you. How could the disciples understand at that moment what Jesus meant? Here he was, full of life. Was it his coming as a servant that was for them? Yeah, perhaps. They could have got that far, maybe. 
They had witnessed his compassion toward many people, themselves included. They had drunk extraordinary wine. They had benefited from an unexpectedly large catch of fish. They had eaten with thousands of the five barley loaves and a few fish. They had seen him walk on the water, still a stormy sea, heal a close relative, raise a friend to life again. They had heard his prayers in the distance. Three of them had witnessed the voice from heaven on that transfiguration mount. Yes, he had given himself for them in his life and ministry. But was that what this meekest of men was calling attention to after the three years he had spent with them? Surely not. But if not, then how was this bread, his body, for them? It would not be until later that they would truly understand how Jesus was giving himself for them. Paul and Luke align themselves by recording the last of these three phrases. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus left his disciples a command to follow, a simple ritual by which to remember him. What were they to do? Do this, take bread, give thanks, break it and eat it in remembrance of him. Both Matthew and Mark give us that last phrase, eat it. Matthew simply records Jesus' words as, take and eat, this is my body. It was for his disciples something that would reconnect them back to this, to the fundamental purpose of his coming and to the compassionate heart of the one they became ready to die for. Perhaps something like this was going around in their minds. What will we be remembering about you, Jesus? And how will this, how will this help us to, to remember you? You are here now with us. Don't talk about remembering you as if we might one day forget. At that moment, perhaps, they were not aware of what they would be remembering in this simple feast. But in a short while, after the traumatic events of the following hours, they would come back to remember. Three days later, early in the morning, some of the women came back with tales of an empty tomb. Peter and John set off running to confirm the truth for themselves. John arrives first and reverently peers into the tomb. Peter runs straight into the tomb, followed by John, both observing the empty grave clothes. And in the words of Don Carson, John testifies that at that moment he perceived that the only explanation was that Jesus, who had been crucified, the Jesus who had been buried in this new tomb had risen from the dead. Understanding began to dawn. On that very evening, after a lesson in history and theology on their journey home, two disciples returned from Emmaus post haste to rejoin the cowering disciples in the upper room. Then Jesus stands among them and we read in Luke's account, he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Fifty days later, at Pentecost, about 120 believers are meeting together in a house in Jerusalem when God comes down upon them by the Holy Spirit. They are transformed and the church is born. Every day they meet together in the temple courts. Then they begin to remember all that Jesus is now to them the promised anointed one of Adonai, who gave himself for them and their salvation. Perhaps at first this was part of their shared meal, just as they had shared the Passover on the night he had been betrayed. Now, literally breaking bread would take them in their experience back to that very night. The answers to their questions clarified by the events they subsequently witnessed. So 
What are we remembering when we obey the Lord Jesus in taking bread, giving thanks, breaking it and eating it? Jesus took the simplest and most humble food, bread, and used it as a symbol, a picture of himself. Believers everywhere could do this. We take bread, ordinary, everyday bread. It is not a virtual, a tangible symbol to represent the Lord Jesus. It's not a virtual symbol or a concept, but something we can touch. We can feel the texture. Bread we can taste. Just as John was able to witness to the fact that the disciples saw Jesus with their eyes and touched him with their hands in 1 John. It reminds us Jesus really came as a man and walked this earth. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And as we look back into John chapter 6, we see clearly the connection Jesus was making between the bread as a symbol of his body and him crucified, a sacrifice through which we can have the sort of life that is eternal, that is in relationship with the triune God. And he took the bread and broke it. Note again the picture. For in contrast, not one of his bones would be broken but a picture, nevertheless, of his body broken in death. It was broken for them and for us. He died, separated from his father. For a moment in time, the eternal relationship between the father and the only begotten son was severed as Christ bore our sin and endured the father's wrath. Jesus experienced separation so that we would not need to bear the pain of eternal separation from our Creator. He gave himself in obedience, even to death on a cross. So we remind ourselves that Jesus died for us. He died for me. He died so that the chains of sin that held me, that held each one of us, might be broken. And just as Jesus broke the bread, so we also have broken bread and better demonstrated when we have a portion of bread to physically break. We look back to the cross. We see ourselves there, hammering in the nails, deriding him. And then we look as the scales fall from our eyes and see such love. We hear the words, Father, forgive them. We look and see his wounds, his body broken, and we hear him cry out in a loud voice as his life ends, as his work ends. Broken for us, he bore in his body our sin upon the tree. We are to give thanks. Jesus gave thanks over broken bread, knowing that this was about to happen to him. He would be broken. He gave thanks to the Father. We give thanks. For what? For the bread? No, for him. We give thanks for his life of compassion, certainly. For his obedience to the Father. For his sacrifice. We give thanks for the Father's provision for our sin, for God's mercy and grace in sending him so that we might see the Father imaged in a holy man. We give thanks that he has opened our eyes to see the love of God in Christ at Calvary. We give thanks because the grave could not hold him. We give thanks for his death for us. He died so that I might not die, 
and then we receive the bread as it were from his hand and we eat it we consume it the bread becomes a part of us this reminds us of that very old message God tried to teach his ancient people in the wilderness we do not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of Adonai the Lord as Jesus put it we need to eat his flesh meaning that we need to put our trust in him for every aspect of our lives he needs to be made part of our lives moment by moment when Jesus heard the disciples grumbling about what he had said he gave them this answer it is the spirit who gives life the flesh counts for nothing the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life Jesus clearly says to them I'm talking symbolically but with almost everything Jesus had to say this was a paradigm shift this was revolutionary thinking this was mind-blowing sometimes we perhaps give the impression that once we have put our trust in him for the first time that's it no this feast reminds us that we need to come to him regularly even moment by moment to depend on him for our spiritual food so that we can really live in an intimate and dynamic relationship of abundant life Jesus said I am the bread of life and as we eat the bread it is not that his body somehow becomes part of ours but rather as God's children we are reminded that he has made us part of his eternal body so as we eat we are, are to remember that our very lives depend on us keeping close to him read his word talk to him listen to him share yourself with him shortly we will take bread and break it we will give thanks for the Lord Jesus broken for us and remind ourselves that he gave his life that we might have fullness of life we will distribute the bread and eat it reminding ourselves that without him we are dead reminding ourselves to make Jesus an inseparable part of our lives reminding ourselves to trust him moment by moment because our spiritual life is only invigorated when we recognize that without him we can do no more we can no more continue to live in the eternal life of relationship with him than we can exist on this earth without bread for our bodies amen <laughs>